Hello and welcome. I'm Kamla. My guests today are Ken Burns and Raymond Santana. Ken Burns has a new documentary out called The Central Park Five, and here's a quick look at it. I want us to remember what happened that day and be horrified by ourselves. The Central Park Five is a powerful new documentary by filmmaker Ken Burns. The film follows the story of how five young New York teenagers were tried as adults and convicted of rape in the famous case of the Central Park jogger. In 1989, a young female jogger's body was discovered in Central Park. She had been raped and was in bad shape when her body was discovered. The teenagers spent between 6 to 13 years in prison before a confession from a serial rapist and DNA evidence proved their innocence. I'm the one that did this. The Central Park Five tells the story of five young men and how a miscarriage of justice impacted their lives. Ken Burns and Raymond Santana were in San Francisco to attend the Mill Valley Film Festival and we caught up with them to talk about the film. Okay, and, and the lady, one of the uh, uh, ladies involved there is Linda Fairstein, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there was a story that I read up in either the New Yorker or New York Times that when this case came, she went to Morgenthau and pleaded that she should be given the case. Uh, yes. Um, why didn't you include that in the in the documentary? Well, she was she was the head of the sex crimes division. It was her case to have. It wasn't so much the pleading, and that was um, um, not germane to the story. She was automatically involved in it from the very beginning and served not only as a prosecutor but as an investigator, along with Elizabeth Letterer, who then became the chief counsel at the trial and who did the actual videotape things. But you know, a film is always the melting down of a lot of. Uh, different elements. There are so many other uh, things that we're hoping other journalists will take and run with from this. This is a two-hour film that I think does a very dense and good job of communicating this, but uh, obviously when you've got hours and hours of other footage, some things uh, get in and some things don't, and that's hardly germane to the case. She was the head of the Sex Crimes Division. Okay, and so you were then uh, tried and uh, sent to jail. Yeah. And uh, you spent how many I years? I spent seven years in prison. Seven years. Yeah. And then you came out, and yeah. then you, you had a hard time. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I had a hard time. It was I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, land employment. Nobody was gonna hire me with a criminal record, especially when you have a rapist label on it. Um, and so, uh, and and at this point in my life, I'm older now. You know, I'm living with my dad, and and, and, and I'm taking up a lot of space, and and so I just I wind up folding. I wind up, you know, I didn't have a proper. Uh, 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 reintroduction back into society. There was no transitional period for me. You know, no, there was no programs that said, look, come here, we're gonna show you how to get back into the swing of things. And so I had to fend for myself and I didn't know what to do. Um, how, uh, how did you react when, you, when it was announced that this, this is the guy that who actually committed the crime? <coughs> do you remember the day? Yeah, I, I called my dad and I was in, I was in prison when I called him. And, um, and, and he said, uh, you know, sit down, he has something he wants to tell me. And so, um, and, and so he went on to say that they finally found the guy that, uh, that who, who committed the crime, which is Mateus Reyes. And I was so institutionalized that I didn't even believe him. That I figured that they would just sweep, sweep this under the rug and make him the sixth man and I was going to just keep this label. You know, and I wound up hanging the phone up on him. You didn't believe him? I didn't believe him at first. But uh, the loss of innocence must have been something that you've struggled with. Yes. Because it was your teenager years. Yes. That, you know, like in the movie, one of them says, we didn't have prom, we didn't yeah. get to go to high school. How are you dealing with it now? Well, I mean, now, you know, things have changed. I'm much older, um, but it's still a struggle because this chapter is still open. This chapter isn't closed. So I can't move forward until this is all done. Because there's a Yeah, because it's still a suit pending. And plus, you know, they're still saying that we're guilty. So that's another aspect that we have to deal with. Oh, you're still guilty? No, they're saying that we're still guilty. The okay. City. Oh, the city still says. So Some this is parts of the city have said that. The courts have recognized that their convictions are vacated, but it is in the interest of people whose reputations would be damaged, like Linda Fairstein, to continue to insist that they're guilty. And so the city is in agreement with her, pushing back against the civil suit and not settling it. 
So is there some goodness even in those who commit crimes, like the the real guy who committed the crime? He, well, this is a story of people uh, unwilling to admit their mistakes, but very interestingly enough, the worst person in all of this, the rapist, admitted his, uh, it's hardly a mistake, his horrific crime. Um, and uh, if he can do it, then anybody can do it. Sure. And that's what draws you to stories like this, because in one of your interviews, you've said that in any, every story, that is the good and the bad elements, and you keep the tension. Well, I think this is something that Keats wrote a letter about William Shakespeare, and he said that Shakespeare had negative uh, capability. That was his ability to keep in tension both the good and the bad of, uh, within somebody and within a story at large, and that's a good thing to have. And good story means that even the best heroes have some undertow, and even the worst villains have some some positive thing. So you don't want to ever make everything black and white, which is what the media did, what the prosecutors did, what the police did, and all of this. And this is based on a book that your daughter wrote. Well, she, it's, she wrote a book that's very different from this film that's wonderful. Uh, it was her interest in it, and reading the first few pages of it when she was working on it convinced us all that we needed to make a film. And so the film, you can read the book and the film, and they're entirely two different animals, but they're an attempting to cast light on, on an aspect of this story that has not seen very much play, which is the lives of these five individuals who had their youth stolen from them. And now there's an interesting wrinkle in it because uh, you tried, I guess, uh, talking to the police and others to come yeah, and we, talk. we made concerted effort uh, on a regular basis to ask the police and the prosecutors to speak and they all declined and more often than not didn't even have the courtesy of returning our phone calls. And it seems so interesting that after we've been to the Cannes Film Festival and Telluride in Toronto and now at Mill Valley that uh, now they would take this time to subpoena all of our records. Old is is a delaying tactic. They're trying to look for inconsistencies so they say, Raymond, you told Ken you entered the park at 9.01. Uh, you know, you told us you uh, entered at 9.02. Do you always lie? Yeah. That's what okay, it so it's all yeah. in, the, in the little details. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's what, uh, that's what it is about. Uh, you were born in New York. I was born in, in Brooklyn and, and, uh, and spent almost no time there. Uh, in, in New York City, my parents lived in New York, and then I uh, moved around as a faculty child. But I've, my older grown daughters live there, my granddaughter uh, lives there, so I spent a lot of time. Okay. Thank you so Thank much you. for your time. Thank you. Thank you.